the world is a stressful place right now. And the more that we can be calm and present in our bodies, the more that we can remind ourselves of how to be calm in stressful situations so we can make better decisions, the better lives we're all going to have. And that radiates and ripples out from us as individuals into our entire communities. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empowered Neurologist. One of the things that we've talked about uh, very often on our program is the importance of really reining in our various metabolic uh, variables and things like sleep have a huge impact, stress management, the amount of exercise we get, uh, limiting our exposure to environments that are challenging to us, and even the production of things like anxiety can be really threatening to our health. And the real question would be then, as we talk to our various experts, well, what do you do about it? Well, you know, you could say, well, limit your stress, limit your anxiety, but that's not necessarily in line with the kind of world in which we live. And oftentimes things can carry on throughout the day and affect the quality of sleep that we get. So to look at a new technology that might help us across this spectrum, I think is really very exciting, especially as it relates to a wearable device that might help us manage uh, our interaction with stressful experiences, manage our level of anxiety, and even help us sleep. There is a device called the Apollo device created by Apollo Neurosciences. And Dr. David Rabin is the founder of this technology. And I thought, wouldn't it be terrific to interview him today and learn about a wearable technology that might really offer us up a powerful leg up in terms of managing the world in which we live. Let me tell you a little bit uh, more about Dr. Rabin. Dr. David Rabin, he's an MD and PhD. He is a board certified psychiatrist and neuroscientist. And as mentioned, he is the co-founder and chief medical officer at Apollo Neuroscience, the first scientifically validated wearable system to improve heart rate variability. And we'll talk about that today. Focus, relaxation, and access to a meditative state by delivering gentle layered vibrations to the skin. In addition to his clinical psychiatry practice, Dr. Rabin is also the co-founder and executive director of the Board of Medicine and a psychedelic clinical researcher currently evaluating the mechanism of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in treatment resistant mental illnesses. So it's quite clear that Dr. Rabin uh, is highly qualified uh, to be involved in this kind of research and in the development of this type of product. So let's jump right into our interview. Well, Dr. Raven, nice to meet you. We've never chatted before, and uh, thank you for being on the program today. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. So where did it all begin? Why did you think uh, that you wanted to look towards technology for various problems? What got you going? Uh, it's a great question. I, I, so I'm a psychiatrist and neuroscientist, and I've been working and researching on chronic stress for the better part of 20 years. Um, and this has always been something that interested me greatly because when we're under stress and, we're, and we have an illness, it often becomes harder to address and treat that illness. Uh, but we often don't employ or, or use the tools to address the underlying stress that might be making an illness worse. I started to, I was treating a lot of veterans with PTSD um, who were coming back from uh, conflict zones. And <clears throat> this was really interesting to me as a, as a group, because in the world of chronic stress and stress in general, veterans are some of the most highly trained uh, folks and soldiers to uh, tackle and manage stress and they're trained for stress. But when they, many of them come back from conflict, back to civilian life, they really struggled to, to integrate back into civilian life. And that's when a lot of their symptoms started to arise in the form of PTSD or traumatic brain injury symptoms. And they really struggled. And this was a good part of my patient population over the last 10 years. And I was always fascinated by working with these folks because they're so highly trained. And um, in the Western psychiatry paradigm of the way we treat PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, we are taught to use uh, a cohort of, uh, you know, group of medications um, and really focus on medication-based treatments, which really don't address the need of probably close to 70% of people who are ever diagnosed with PTSD. 
Um, and the psychotherapy techniques combined with the medication work better, but we're still seeing over 50% of people who are ever diagnosed with PTSD continue to have symptoms of the disorder long term. So people really weren't getting better. And this was very discouraging to both us, the clinicians, and to our patients. And people were losing faith in the system and the treatment. And so for us, you know, in my in my practice, I started to ask the question of perhaps maybe the the pathway of treating these disorders with symptom numbing or just targeting the symptoms on the surface uh, were not and, and sedating people in a large part or numbing people to their feelings was not actually getting to the heart of the problem. And maybe there was more lying underneath the surface, um, as I'm sure you've seen as well in your practice. Treating the fire, not just focusing on the smoke. You You bet. Right. And so, or the, yeah, and the source of what's causing that fire. Right. And, and so that really started to, as a, as a researcher and a, and a clinician, I started to dive deeper into that. And I started to research everything that worked for these people, because if our treatments weren't working, something was keeping these people alive and, and relatively functional. And so I started to look at everything from Eastern practices, meditation, breathwork, yoga, um, and then things like therapeutic touch, um, soothing touch, um, and of course, that led me down a path of looking at um, safety pathways because the most well characterized concepts around trauma um, are really around uh, being exposed to to fear or threat over and over and over again. And when we're exposed to threat, even if it's perceived threat, not actual threat, we start to feel unsafe in our bodies. And there are actual signatures that are very easy to measure in our bodies that show that we're unsafe, like high resting heart rate, low heart rate variability, high respiratory rate, high blood pressure, right? These are objective cardiovascular signs that we can measure just through the skin alone. And they correlate with increased racing thoughts, hypervigilance, poor sleep, all of the things that we see in the symptoms of these folks. And so as I started to look at that, I said, well, what on the forefront is coming out right now that is really changing the way we're thinking about PTSD? And back in 2012, this led me to start to look at um, MDMA-assisted therapy because MDMA is a methamphetamine-derived molecule that specifically stimulates the emotional cortex of the brain and, a lot of, and, and facilitates what we call safety relearning or fear extinction. And this is a very well understood pathway. It's understood in humans, it's understood in animals. It's been very well characterized. And MDMA is capable in the most recent trials of inducing symptom remission in people who have had severe treatment resistant PTSD for on average over 17 years with just three doses of medicine and 42 hours of psychotherapy. People over 50% over of people, I think it's actually over 67% now are actually entering symptom remission and that persists long term at one year out. And MDMA works by activating the safety pathway. People have to just take a moment here and and really understand what you just said, because these are, are individuals with really recalcitrant issues as it relates to the um, improvements they, they might get with standard pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy for that matter. That this really represents an incredible breakthrough for people who are profoundly compromised. So. Those numbers that you just quoted with respect to MDMA assisted intervention are breathtaking. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely stunning and and I think paradigm shifting for our field because if you look at the data from uh, the studies of of our standard of care, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft, which are our two primary medications that are FDA cleared for PTSD treatment, that the, all the studies show that once you stop treatment that people almost invariably relapse. Almost everybody relapses and, and has uh, disease again. But with MDMA therapy from the phase two trials that followed people one year out, what's really fascinating is that 55% of people, which is already better than what we see with SSRIs within just 12 weeks of treatment, are no longer meeting diagnostic criteria for PTSD. And these are people who have tried everything prior to entering this trial. And then they followed those folks one year out after treatment had stopped. And at one year out, that number went up from 55% to 67% with no and additional when did treatment. did you ever see that? Right? We've never Normally seen that. Normally there's a decay in efficacy. But um, I have to ask you, in your uh, view, why the pushback all these years? I mean, are we still back? 
in the early 1970s when psychedelics were char- had a certain characteristic that was put forth by media to make us believe that they were universally detrimental. Why has there been with this efficacy, not just with MDMA, but other psychedelic uh, assisted forms of therapy, why the pushback? I think there's two major there's two major reasons, one of which is the first thing that you mentioned, which is that we're still recovering from the propaganda of the 60s and 70s, the, the Nixon age propaganda that resulted in a blanket illegalization of everything from indigenous tr- and tribal plant medicines like peyote and ayahuasca and things of that nature all the way to, and cannabis, of course, which started as one of the first illegal plant medicines. And then that's per- that misunderstanding propagated into the medical field and has persisted over time. And it, what's interesting is if you go back 100, uh, 120 years, cannabis uh, and cannabinoid products were a mainstay of medical treatment. And, and so it's been, it's, you, know, the, I, you know, I hesitate to, to focus on this too much, but a lot of it was racially motivated. And mm. now there's been much information that has come to the surface around how illegalizing these indigenous plant medicines and m- synthetic psychedelic medicines was actually motivated to target anti-Vietnam War um, leaders and minority leaders and minority figures that were uh, known to be involved in these uh, in in this work back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, as a way to control the the narrative and to imprison minorities. And it's really a shame. And so I yeah. think now the evidence, thanks to Rick Doblin and ben, Roland Griffiths and many other incredible researchers in the field, has really taken us to a level where the data is undeniable that these medicines are transforming the way we think about mental health. And that and that medicine and that and that these treatments can actually some of these illnesses can actually potentially be cured which we never thought about before. Yeah. Well, we did digress a bit, but I think it's really important to contextualize exactly how, what was the delay? What gave, what was a three decade, you know, setback, but now being rectified. So let's continue. So we, you, you uh, embrace the validity of this type of psychedelic intervention, but you are looking at technology as well. Yeah. So, so this led me, so, so I, so I, I reviewed all these trials that were being done in the psychedelic space. I saw how groundbreaking the initial results were again, going back to 2012. And I became fascinated by this area because what we were seeing was so different than what we were seeing in the Western paradigm of mental health treatment. And then in 2016, I approached Rick Doblin, the executive director of maps. And I asked him, you know, Rick, the results that you're getting from your trials are really tremendous can we do some studies to show how these medicines work, not just that they work? And at that time, Rick didn't really care or put any research or emphasis or financing into the mechanism. He was really focused on just getting FDA clearance, understandably, because that was the path. And I'm a mechanism guy. So I was like, Rick, we got to figure this out because if we can figure out how they work, we can potentially create technology tools and other tools that are more accessible to our communities because MDMA I'm talking 2012, we're in 2023, MDMA is still not legal. It's cleared, F- it's finished FDA trials for phase three. Um, it's shown incredible results, but it's not gonna be available for, for use in the clinic until 2024 likely. Um, and there's still a lot of barriers to access. It's gonna cost probably between 10 and $14,000 to access that treatment, which is a lot of money. And most people can't afford that and it won't be reimbursable for a long time. So seeing those barriers, and explaining this to Rick and the importance of understanding the mechanism, he actually agreed and he got me and three of my colleagues uh, MDMA therapy trained under MAPS, which was uh, a, a great blessing and I'm very grateful to him for that. Uh, and from there, I was able to understand what MDMA was doing in the context of the prior scientific research that had been done, showing that MDMA is actually reconditioning our fear response in our brains in animals. And then we saw that in our patients, in the trainings, in the clinic. And as I started to see that effectively, what MDMA was doing is it seems to be molecularly amplifying safety cascades between the emotional cortex, what we call the limbic system and the amygdala, our fear center that is over overreactive in PTSD and telling the amygdala, hey, you're not under survival threat right now. You're safe enough to reevaluate the meaning of traumatic events in your life 
and remake meaning around them. And when people feel safe enough to do that, all of a sudden you can actually repair past memories and the damage that some of those memories have caused like victim mindset and things like that. And so safety as a core principle, which we're all taught in medical school as critical for building our patient doctor relationship is something that's often lost nowadays in, in treatment. And that became a focus for me. And so we started to look at, well, what else makes people feel safe naturally? And the things that came to the top of the list were, unsurprisingly, soothing touch, the smell of your mom's chicken soup, soothing music, getting a hug from a loved one or holding a pet. And the things that came to the top, top of the list were soothing touch, because soothing touch activates a neural cascade in our bodies that is hundreds of millions of years old, going back to ancient mammals that first nursed their young when they were born. It's nonverbal. It's nearly instantaneous and it requires no effort to receive. And so pulling on those threads, we thought, well, what if we could stimulate the touch receptors in a soothing way using something like gentle sound waves that are felt as vibration through the skin that could augment the functioning of our safety response system in our bodies and give people some of the benefits that are similar to soothing touch or similar to MDMA therapy by activating that safety pathway in a continuous fashion on the go with a wearable. And that ultimately became Apollo that was launched in 2020, uh, January, 2020. That's, that's quite a story. So you're, you're emulating here the scent, this uh, soothing touch as a way of allowing people to feel less fear, less amygdala activation, perhaps more uh, able to make better decisions because they're not, uh, they're, they're able to recruit more information by virtue of being not locked into amygdala type responses, but being able to access more sophisticated parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and make better decisions, calm down and get on with life in a non-pharmaceutical way by emulating the comfort and the security that we get by being stimulated with sound waves. Exactly. And, and, and most of us understand this feeling when you explain it to them like music, because all of us have heard music that feels good and calms us down. When you're having a terrible day and you're driving home stuck in traffic and your favorite song comes on the radio, you're, you're in it with the music, right? And you start, your shoulders start to come down, you start breathing a little slower, your heart rate comes down, your thoughts start to slow down, and, and you start to feel a little bit better, even just a little bit. And m almost every person I've ever met can recall an experience like that. It's very familiar. And so music and sound has a historical lineage in our society of being a tool that helps us to recover. And so we thought as musicians, neuroscientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, et cetera, can we take what we know from the neuroscience of music, apply it to an understudied field of, of, of touch, and then just compose music for the skin as the sensor rather than the ears, because we need our ears for everything. So if you could deliver it to the skin, then you can give it to people on the go and they can take it with them wherever they are. And ultimately we've seen the same benefits that we see with soothing touch or soothing music, like decreased heart rate, decreased respiratory rate, decreased blood pressure, increased HRV, relaxation of the body, shoulders, back, uh, muscle tension, decrease in racing thoughts, improvement of clarity, decision-making, cognitive performance and recovery, because we're just targeting the same pathway by following those nervous system lines that go throughout our bodies that have evolved over hundreds of millions of years. It, it, it's, it's very soothing and very calming. I, I generally, I don't think that I have a high degree of anxiety. For example, when I'm interviewing smart people like you on my podcast, I'm wearing the Apollo device right here. And I have to tell you, at, it's sort of cycling through a vibration. Uh, you know, it's, it's time on, time off, time on. And I don't know, is it emulating the sound of my mother's voice when I was in, you know, in the womb? Uh, but there's something about it that is very, very calming. And I know that uh, aside from sleep, we'll talk about that in just a minute. You're, you mentioned or talk about the notion that even during the day in stressful situations, uh, in social situations, et cetera, in fact, th it's programmable, uh, that it can, you have energy, uh, social focus, recover, calm, unwind, uh, fall asleep, you know, various modes that, uh, you're able to set the device for. Uh, and so how do you, 
you work with the variables, the time on, time off, the intensity, et cetera. How do you determine what is the recipe for each of these goals that you're trying to accomplish? That's a great question. Um, so I think the first step was, again, looking, starting with the neurobiology, right? So if we understand how our brains and bodies evolved to function and where those nerves start and where they end in the brain, then it's actually by reverse engineering the touch receptor system that, that helped us to understand what feels soothing to us. And what feels soothing to us is what activates our touch receptors. There's about five to seven touch receptors that are really critical throughout our whole bodies. Uh, and by activating them at the rhythm that they like to be activated at, which is that rhythm of the up and down wave that you mentioned earlier, oh. that that particular rhythm is a rhythm that allows them to continuously receive soothing input without becoming desensitized. And so that was really important because if you deliver the same solid tone to the body, like, or, or a very fast notification based vibration to the body, the body either becomes tolerant or agitated. And that was not what we wanted. We don't want to cap captivate somebody's attention and make them uncomfortable. We want to help them be passively more present and mindful in the moment. And so that actually starting there at the, at the neurophysiology of how these, this touch receptor system works and how it interfaces with the emotional brain, that was where everything began. And then that went into effectively a whole lot of Thomas Edison style clinical trials where we made lots of different vibration patterns that were everything from cell phones, similar to cell phones to similar to massage chairs to these patented vibrations that became Apollo. Um, and we tested them in double blind randomized placebo controlled crossover studies with placebo active controls, inactive controls, and then the actual Apollo vibrations. And everybody in the trials, not knowing what they were getting, experienced all the vibration patterns and had to, had to perform stressful tasks in one arm. And in the other arm had to just tell us subjectively, how do you feel on a, on a spectrum of rating energy to mood? And then we, we saw that people rated actually relatively consistently within 30 seconds, 80% of people could rate accurately the same in the same range. So we then took everything that was rated as unpleasant and uncomfortable out and then zoomed in on everything that was rated as pleasant, comfortable. And then we saw that those vibra vibration patterns were actually increasing heart rate variability within three minutes and under stress and increasing cognitive performance up to 25%. And the more that HRV went up, the more that cognitive performance went up because people were calm and more present in the moment and effectively had more, it, they didn't have tunnel vision, right? They had mm -hmm. access to more of themselves when they were trying to focus on a stressful task. And so as we started to see that in these different settings from cognitive stressors like NASA gives to their astronauts before they go into space to extreme athletic performance, to people with PTSD, anxiety disorders, traumatic brain injury, et cetera, uh, to people who are just struggling with insomnia in their day to day um, and work related stress, we started to find patterns. And as we found those patterns, we just kept iterating and iterating and testing. And it was this testing across 1000s of people over the time between 2016, 2017 and 2020, when we launched the product that ultimately steered us and helped us to understand that we actually respond very similarly to vibration across the board in humans and our touch receptors all work relatively the same. And that when you deliver the right signal to the body, it actually induces a state that's called cardiorespiratory resonance, which is what happens to our heart and lungs when we enter into a meditative state, which means about five to seven breaths per minute. It means you can breathe slower and meditate slower. You can breathe faster and meditate with faster breath, but five to seven breaths per minute is a sweet spot that was discovered by biofeedback research over the last 60 years that is where our heart rate variability starts to trend up within three minutes and where our cognitive performance and our mood and our anxiety start to improve. And so that became the focus and that's where we drove the technology from there. Well, hi everyone, Dr. David Promoter here. Uh, we hope you're enjoying this content and if you would do so, go ahead and hit the like button. And if you're not already a subscriber to our channel, please consider doing so. Uh, we're really grateful to have you as part of our community. So let's get right back to the presentation. You mentioned this metric, 
uh, heart rate variability. We've talked about it on this program before as an indicator uh, uh, that is associated with positive uh, health uh, parameters, the higher it is. And it's basically the the variation in the time between one heartbeat and the next, to be very simple about it. And the idea is we want that, that variation uh, to be higher. The higher the number, seemingly the better it is. It does get lower and lower with age. Uh, it's one of the metrics that we get when you look at your sleep metrics, for example, with an aura ring. Uh, and people may wonder, well, gee, what is this HRV thing that, uh, that I'm looking at? We've been looking at heart rate variability for probably 20 years now as it relates to stress and as it relates to interventions like meditation that can help increase heart HRV or heart rate variability. But you're able to demonstrate some pretty significant improvements in HRV with using the Apollo device. Yeah, HRV was a key metric for us because when we first started working on this technology, which of, which now, of course, is a consumer wearable, it's not a medical device, but um, because it had it was so safe and, and accessible to everyone, um, and most of our early users were healthy and not sick, so that um, steered us towards the consumer market. But HRV became really interesting because the things that that if you have low heart rate variability, as you mentioned earlier, um, having low heart rate variability in the documented scientific literature increases your risk of getting sick with mental or physical illness. It, decre it, de it negatively correlates with longevity. So the lower your HRV, the more likely you are to not live a long, healthy life, the more likely you are to make mistakes, the lower your vagal tone is, so the, so the lower your recovery nervous system activity is, and uh, the more emotionally reactive and irritable we are. And so low HRV predicts all of these things. And when you start to apply that to uh, clinically sick populations like people with cardiovascular disorders or chronic pain or depression, anxiety, PTSD, almost all of these folks have HRV that is in the pits. It's like the, amongst the lowest that we see. And when people have low HRV and PTSD is one example, it it, low HRV predicts a poor treatment response. And so we thought, well, if HRV is a sign, which we know it to be now, that our stress response system, our sympathetic fight or flight system is getting too many resources, it's overactive too much of the time, and our vagal parasympathetic recovery system is underactive uh, in those states, then if we deliver more safe stimulation to the body in any form, breath work, mindfulness yoga practices, movement, soothing touch, right? Apollo vibrations, soothing music, it should increase HRV. And overwhelmingly it does. So looking when we were studying Apollo, looking at what happened to HRV was a huge metric of importance for us because if we're improving heart rate variability, we should improve symptoms, we should improve cognitive performance, we should improve physical recovery and all the things that go along with having better vagal tone and more recovery nervous system activity. And that's exactly what we saw. And that was a really exciting finding because up until the point that we just made that discovery in, I guess it must've been 2018 now, um, there has never been a technology that you can just strap onto your body or use without effort that increases heart rate variability. There has never been anything that has ever been able to do that. Um, it, all, all the tools that increase heart rate variability require a substantial amount of effort on the part of the user. So for us, that was a huge, huge uh, uh, target for us. And it really helped us to understand in the body what's actually happening when people are saying, I feel better, or I'm performing better, or I'm less stressed. Well, your HRV is going up. And now we can track that over time using other wearables and in the lab. Well, I, I, I was, let's say, a bit concerned about my HRV. It was running in the mid to upper 30s. I'm going You're to not the only some, one. <laughs> pardon me? You're not the only one. Yeah. And I will tell you, I've been using the Apollo device. And this is last night. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, the, but Is that a 64? Yeah, my HRV average was 64, maximum was 141. Oh, wow. Um, my lowest uh, heart rate was 47. And uh, overall, so I slept for seven hours, 48 minutes, which is a little bit um, a little bit uh, less than I would normally sleep. 87 optimal. And uh, for me, importantly, my deep sleep was two hours, 40 minutes, meaning 
this the time of sleep during which I'm activating the lymphatic system to clean the brain. But I have to tell you, as an N of one, my HRV numbers are really great. And I'm really, you know, that was one of the metrics I was not pleased with. Um, it make, it's made me very, very happy because I, I need to see data. It's one thing to say, well, I feel better because I did X, Y, or Z. But I, I'd like to know when somebody's going to lower my postprandial glucose or my average glucose, in this case, raise my HRV, unlike anything I've ever done before, including breath work, including meditation, including all the things that, you know, I try to do in our stressful world to back down a little bit because I'm a kind of, uh, I, I can be a bit intense. I know that. So that's yeah, you're a, you're a high performing guy. I I, and I, and I, I saw that in the, in my HRV numbers, which were not, you know, in many other parameters I look at, I'm kind of pleased with, you know, the, the benefits of my dedication, but HRV is a tough nut to crack for many people. And it was for me, but I'm going to give you a lot of credit for your uh, device here because you see what my HRV is doing now. And I am really very happy about that because like you said, I know the health and illness implications of a lower HRV, how uh, heart rate variability. I'm, I'm emphasizing that because I really want our viewers to get that. If you wear an aura ring and many other devices now these days, I think even the Apple Watch may give you HRV, yep. newer one. But uh, this is a really good thing to know because it has implications for your metabolic health and your immunological health. And if you know, you've been following the science, that's where it's at for heart health and brain health and uh, mood stabilization, mental health, if you will. Um, so uh, I want to thank you for that because uh, that was, for me, um, a bit of an epiphany. Yeah, that's that's amazing to hear. I mean, that automatically puts you into one of the top responders because you're getting like 2 to 4x your baseline HRV from using Apollo. So that, and I think that tells a really interesting story that we see all the time, which is that I think also, as you alluded to earlier, we don't necessarily realize how stressed we are or how much stress we carry with us on a regular basis because we've adapted to it for so many years. We've just become accustomed to it. And so that's, that's you know, we just don't realize that we're carrying that load with us until the load is lifted off. And then you're like, oh, wow, I feel so much lighter, right? I feel so much more rested. I feel so much more clear. And and HRV is an interesting metric of that because for those of us who don't realize how stressed out we are mentally, our bodies know, right? Our bodies store that information in the uh, autonomic nervous system, which is that balance between our fight or flight stress response system, sympathetic. It keeps the score. It keeps the score, right? And and so and we have to hit the body. You what you're talking about earlier. It does tend to lock us into more of an amygdala-based behavior pattern. Exactly. Yeah, we see the world as threatening no matter what. And uh, suddenly, and I think as HRV might, might be a, a surrogate for this idea that maybe you're offloading some of this amygdala uh, based mentality or behavior uh, because you're seemingly less affected by perceived threats around you. Not that, that it's not good to, to be able to respond to threatening experiences, that's for sure. But, you know, day in and day out, I don't think there's anyone who would argue the point that. The world is threatening right now, you know, and, and perhaps more so than than ever. I mean, we went through COVID that was day in and day out a kind of a threatening time. And that that may have tempered us a bit and or set the stage, you know, the, the set point a little bit higher for now, the things going on around us. So uh, so you know, anything that if, in fact, HRV is our way of um, being able to appreciate how we are responding to these threats or perceived threats around us then I'm all in. I, I love it as a metric. Yeah. And, and it's a fascinating one. And I think it's going to, it's coming up in our field as one of the, and the field of biohacking and public health as one of the most reliable predictors of long-term health and, and um, quality of life, which is really interesting. Um, and I think to, to riff on something that you mentioned earlier, perceived versus actual threat, right? Our bodies don't know the difference. It's up to us up here to remind ourselves what is real survival threat, which is supposed to send our heart rate up and supposed to send our blood pressure up and our breath rate to get to safety. And what is perceived threat, 
which is not actually a survival threat where we don't, we don't want our bodies to react that way. And when we're surrounded by so much input, so much stimulation, so much noise, so much news, so much chaos in the world, what happens is we get into a hyper reactive state. I see this in my patients all the time. I see it in myself watching the news, right? And we accidentally do something called misappropriation of threat which effectively is a fancy way of saying we confuse things that are not survival threat, like too many emails, too many kids screaming, too many responsibilities with actual survival threat, like threat of death, lack, lack of food, water, right. shelter, right? And, and that is a very important thing for us to be aware of because that is literally the key that helps to keep us in balance and performing at our best and rec as recovered as possible when we are in our day to day and not actually in a survival situation. Yeah. And you, you mentioned PTSD and I think to be fair, these diagnoses uh, are very analog uh, in their nature that, you know, to say, well, we all have a degree of autism. We all have a degree of PTSD that it's not like pregnancy. You either is or you ain't, you know, that we all have some, uh, some conditioning whereby we might react to what might not be a threatening situation with a little bit of increased cortisol excretion, decline in our HRV, a typical stress response, which affects immune function, affects microbiome, take it where you will. But you know, you don't have to have a full blown diagnosis of PTSD to think that there may be some benefit for you in looking at things that are going to increase your HRV or are going to help you deal with the, the normal world around you. So, you know, the world is challenging, we get that, but, uh, you know, whatever we can do. Uh, what is, um, maybe you could tell us about some of the feedback you're getting from clients. Ends of one, I appreciate that. This isn't science, but it's been said that the plural of anecdote is data. <laughs> We're not gonna write a paper on this, but what are you hearing? So I think one of the most interesting things that I'm hearing and that I've been hearing over the years is, well, you know, we hear a lot. I think the thing that I hear, so I'll, I'll, maybe I'll go through the, the ones that are, were always most interesting to me. So people are using Apollo since we released it in the early prototyping days back when the, the vibes weren't really labeled. People were just using it as they wish and it was relatively blinded. People were using it for creativity, for social anxiety and public speaking. I actually used Apollo myself when I first started presenting this. I still use it every day, but I used it um, during my public speaking engagements because I used to have some public speaking anxiety left over from my early days in school. And using it for a few months dramatically helped my public speaking anxiety nice. to almost eliminate it because I realized I had like a mindful moment on stage one day. I remember the first time I was using it when I was presenting in front of a whole room full of physicians and scientists about my research. And I had a moment of mindfulness where I recognized that I am spending at least 50% of my brain's resources thinking about what other people are thinking about me while I'm here on stage. What if I just took that 50% of those resources and I applied them to thinking about and focusing on what I'm here to talk about. Wouldn't I present better? And then that's what people are here to see me do. And when I started to think about it that way, which seemed relatively rational, all of a sudden my talks got better and I got way less prying questions because I was presenting at a much higher level. And my anxiety went down because I had less concern about how people were thinking about me. And I wasn't thinking about that so much. It was something I only thought about afterwards when I asked for feedback. And so that became a really interesting uh, test case for me. And now we have thousands of people using Apollo for public speaking and social anxiety, which is one of my favorite not use cases. depending on Inderol, right? What was that? They're not depending on Inderol for panel right. anymore. Right, or benzos or, yeah. or alcohol or anything. You're going to give a great things. talk if you pop a couple of Ativans ahead of time. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and all those medications have side effects, right? We don't have any medications that, are, that don't have some degree of side effect. And I think we forget about that in, in the Western paradigm because people have, we, oftentimes people have been learned to see medication as like a silver bullet to treat their condition. 
but there's no such thing as a silver bullet, right? Even wearable technology, maybe it takes the edge off here or there. You know, Apollo helps to support the body. It's not going to solve all your problems. We have to, we, we have to take it all into account, the entire picture. And so Apollo is a, is, a, is a way that people can start the process if they've never learned what it feels like to be calm in a stressful situation before. It helps you learn how to do that experientially and make help us remember that's possible, that it's actually possible for us to be calm and peaceful and in a blissful mind state in present in it time at times where that was not previously known to us. And then we reinforce that over time with the breathing techniques and the meditation, the mindfulness and the yoga and all the stuff that you talk about on your, on your show and with your clients, you know, this is the core of the work, but we have to help get people there more easily. We have to do a little hand holding. Um, asking a person with PTSD to meditate is basically a recipe for failure because they have right. so many ruminations and negative intrusive thoughts that when you quiet your mind to observe what's in there, people don't like what they find usually. And that's very discouraging for them. So, um, so that was really interesting to me. And, and I think the other side of it is that um, mo the most common thing that people told us about Apollo was that it improved their sleep. Um, and people were sending us data like what you showed me today, where within two to four weeks of using Apollo, their HRV was going up significantly and their deep and REM and total sleep times were going up dramatically, like 30 or more minutes of sleep a night that was concentrated in deep and REM sleep. And for people who have not gotten a good night's sleep in a while, or in as long as they can remember in some cases, that was really game changing for them. And so that actually spurred our entire as you said, anecdote times time and times num you know numbers goes into a, a data study. That's what we did, and we ended up turning that that early, those early reports about sleep into a thirteen hundred over thirteen hundred person study over three years, following people and their sleep data using the Aura Ring. Um, and that data that that study showed very statistically significant results, um, where the use of Apollo over time continues to increase your sleep duration and depth and in a directly proportionate manner. And that was so exciting. Um, and that is now the main reason why people actually use the product. Yeah. Well, especially when what, you know, you look at alternatives, yes, there's melatonin, but a lot of people still seem to reach for a, a pill for a pharmaceutical. And, you know, we could have a discussion in terms of what are the long-term consequences of that and the quality of sleep that is not actually a receipt. In the time we have left, a couple of questions I want to ask you. One thing I, I tend to ask a lot of our guests who are in the development of this type of, of technology, what happened that was unexpected? What did you learn along the way that was just an aha moment, an unexpected uh, discovery? You mean other than, than the discovery itself working, which is so unusual? <laughs> yeah, all, you know, all the good stuff. Yeah. But, you, know, I, I, you know, what was what happened that you went, gosh, we never would have predicted such and such? Well, I think the sleep thing was actually one of the major ones because when we did our first double blind randomized placebo controlled crossover trials at the University of Pittsburgh, um, what we actually were focused on was focus and improving cognitive performance for people with, with PTSD and stress disorders that were struggling to just get through the day. Um, and when we started to after those studies showed very positive results, we said, okay, this is enough evidence to make prototypes that are wearable and then put them out into the world and see what happens. This is a really important point that I want to, I want to uh, sit with for a minute because almost all product companies, if they do clinical trials and come out of the scientific world, don't take this step, which is doing real world data collection and analysis, looking at how, why, and under what circumstances do people use the technology in the real world and what benefits are they getting? And I can tell you how important that was because we did not know that Apollo would help people sleep longer and deeper until we did that. And then we did that and people started flooding us with their sleep data. And that ultimately changed the entire course of the company, um, even ongoing, because when we started to see that, we said, okay, we need to run sleep studies, but then come 2020, uh, COVID hit, and every single sleep lab by March had shut their doors indefinitely. And so we said, okay, well, now we can't do a sleep lab study, but what can we do? Well, we have these little guys. 
So maybe we can email, we can ask our users, will you donate your data to us for a real world trial? And we had that over a thousand people donating their data to us. And we track them over years to show a long-term benefit to sleep, which is now um, being written up for publication. And that, was really game changing for us because it changed the entire course of the company and the way that we designed the product to be useful during sleep. And then that actually led to our most recent product release that is really exciting because this is something we've been working on for over five years, which is how do you, falling asleep is one thing and waking up is another, but what, in, what about in between, right? What happens when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back asleep. There are very, very few tools. There are almost, there are basically no medications that work for that because they all create grogginess the following day, um, which is very undesirable. So how do we, and can we do anything for unwanted middle of the night wakeups? And so we thought, well, what kinds of things work to help with that when you're unconscious? AI, right? AI has a particular use case where it can run processing when we are completely unconscious, asleep, what have you. And so we started developing AI algorithms and training them based on the sleep data we collected from the real world to train Apollo how to track sleep as well as any other consumer sleep tracker, which it now does, and training Apollo to detect when you're about to wake up in the middle of the night using AI, predictive AI, and then turn on gentle mm. vibes when you're asleep that actually interrupt unwanted middle of the night wakeups. And to give you an idea of how impactful that is, we saw in our, just using Apollo by programming it manually, people were getting up to 30 more minutes of sleep a night. Using Apollo with the AI that does this detection and response automatically to keep you asleep in the middle of the night, doubles that. So people are getting over 60 minutes more sleep a night because they are not waking up and not having that racing thoughts. Oh my God, I have to think about all these things. I have work tomorrow. I can't fall back asleep. People are staying asleep. And so that, that early study we did starting back in March of 2020, collecting regular users data translated and, and creating this unforeseen discovery around sleep and that use case led into the development of one of the first AIs for health that integrates into wearable technology to actually solve a really complex public health problem that we have no solutions for today. And that is lack of enough restorative, high quality sleep. Yep. We've talked about it at length on this program as a risk factor for any of the cardiometabolic issues. I don't like the term cardiometabolic. Is it neurometabolic? Is it immunometabolic? I mean, metabolic issues and the wide net that uh, they seem to throw these days. All of the above. So, great work, man. I got to tell you, this is, uh, it's really on the edge. And what I love about what you're doing is that you're moving. You, you keep the ball rolling and who knows what's next. You know, you're going to avail yourself of other types of technology incorporated into the Apollo device. And, you know, for all of us who are wearing uh, Apollos, um, we look forward to that. And uh, and thank you as well for my improvement in HRV. I sure do appreciate that. It's absolutely our pleasure. I mean, you know, as you said, right, the world is is a stressful place right now. And the more that we can be calm and present in our bodies, the more that we can remind ourselves of how to be calm in stressful situations so we can make better decisions, the better lives we're all going to have. And that, and that radi radiates and ripples out from us as individuals into our entire communities. When we feel safer in our own skin, we're able to connect with other people more effectively. We're able to build more deep, meaningful relationships with other human beings because we're not so afraid of taking that chance. And, and it's not just with people. It's with the, the planet itself. We define this in the book, uh, Brainwash, that... I wrote with uh, Austin Perlmutter, our son. Um, and we call it disconnection syndrome, where we are pretty well locked into the amygdala. We are disconnected from that the top-down influence of the prefrontal cortex, and decisions are made based on what I want now, without any consideration for future consequences. So, what you're talking about, and I think again, HRV being a surrogate marker of this relationship is the ability to make better decisions, not just for ourselves, but considering the impact on others and even on the planet. So 
you know, has wide reaching implications. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and to that point, it's it's the the contrast to that is when we're stressed, we make decisions that are very self-centered, self-focused, self-preservation based. But and oftentimes poor decisions as it relates to food choices, for example. Exactly. And not exercising, et cetera. So this gives us a really important on ramp to better decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you for uh, joining us today. And again, uh, congratulations. This is, uh, it's, it's really very enlightening to see where you are now and, you know, certainly consider where you are going to go in the future and bringing all of us along. So, so thanks for spending time with us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. We'll talk soon. Bye for now. Well, that was uh, fascinating, wasn't it? We learned that simply uh, the application of this device can have wide ranging effects that are scientifically documented on our physiology, which are really, really positive, especially these days. So thanks to Dr. David Rabin for joining us today on the program. We'll be back soon. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter for the Empower Neurologist program. Bye for now.